Have you ever wished you could travel all over the world and meet masterful people in the field of education? People you may not have known and the stories you've never heard. Cup of Capacity is just that. I wanted to introduce you to masterful people in education. Some are people I have known and some I have heard about. They were chosen for their unique impact on education and to share the insights they've learned along the way. In a digital setting, each monthly episode features an in-depth conversation with a masterful leader as they explore their journey and answer a series of questions. Grab a refreshment and let's enjoy. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Cup of Capacity. This is an opportunity to sit down with educational leaders and really hear about their lives and their journey and how capacity building has been part of that journey. And by listening, you grow your own capacity. I'm super thrilled to be here today with Dr. Lupita Hinojosa. She is a wonder. She has served as an assistant superintendent of school choice in the largest district in Texas. There she wrote two national magnet grants, which brought more choice and innovation to the district. She began the online school choice application process which eliminated those backdoor kind of magnet programs that we know exist. And she leveled the playing field for all children and their families. She currently serves as the Chief of Innovation and Equity in the Spring Independent School District. And there she strives to create opportunities for all students from various backgrounds, representing diverse populations to ensure excellence and equitable outcomes. She is responsible for leading the planning, development, coordination, assessment, and interpretation of educational programs and supporting 40 schools. That makes me tired just thinking about it. Lupita is an active member of the Region 4 Texas Council of Women School Executives, and she has served as their president. She is a first-generation uh, college graduate and a fellow Longhorn and a proud Latina educator, and she's an inspiration to so many. Lupita, can you tell us a little bit about your journey? Sure, and first and foremost, thank you um, for having me on, Dr. Rosas. It is truly an honor um, to be able to, in a in a in a way, sh um, share my story, and hopefully, it will be an inspiration for others. Um, I really believe that if I can do it, anyone can do it. And so, as you said, first generation college goer, um, daughter of immigrant uh, parents. My dad is from Monterrey and my mom is from San Luis. Uh, they both met at the border town in Matamoros and came into South Texas, specifically San Benito. And so my brother, my sister and I, we were born and raised in San Benito. Um, I am um, one of those English language learners that so many of us know. I actually went straight into school, not speaking a word of English. Um, I started school in the 70s and was one of the very first students to go into a school um, which was being desegregated. So um, you think about the Valley, South Texas now, it's mostly Hispanics, Latinos. Back then it was mostly white. So as I walked down um, that long, long hallway in uh, Landrum Elementary with my mom, who was, you know, pulling along my little brother. He was going into kindergarten. I was going into first grade. It was the most scariest, um, I think, time for me because you hear all the talking and all the noise and people directing people in different directions. Imagine first day of school, children are crying, parents are crying. They don't want to leave their kids either. And you don't know what's happening. Um, my very first day of school was a difficult one. And I will tell you, it didn't get easier in first grade. I was one of four um, Latinos, um, Spanish speaking. Everyone else in my classroom was white, did not speak Spanish, including my first grade teacher. And so while Mrs. Johnson was very harsh, hard, and at that time I didn't appreciate her um, I do have to say, looking back now, she did a lot for us. Um, there were four kids that needed to stay after school. When everybody left and the bell rang, four kids had to stay back. Now, at the end of this tutorial session, there was only one 
there, which was me, because um, Dino and Efrain, they all jumped out of the window and ran <laughs> home. I was the one that had to stay there because mom and dad said, you know, lo que diga la maestra, whatever the teacher says you've got to do. Um, very difficult, but I did know the difference. When we went to recess, I knew my class was different. Um, I could see the other children, I could see the other classrooms, and we were different. At the end of first grade, I went into a second grade classroom that looked a little bit more diverse, but was different, but I still knew I needed to do more. By third grade, I was promoted into, back then, the one or the section one track. And so by then, I was the only Latina, everyone else was white and went through my elementary grades, tracked into what was the honors class. I can tell you, I'm not smart, I'm not brilliant, but I am a hard worker. I did study. Um, coming home after school, what my parents made us do, what my mom and dad made us do, we had to come home, change clothes, of course, because that was our school clothes. We would eat some fideo um, soup, and some Kool-Aid, and then we sat in front of Sesame Street because that's how we learned English, through Sesame Street. We learned our alphabets, our words, and our colors through Sesame Street. Um, so I was tracked, um, and in a way, it helped me get through school. The other piece that I would say is a big part of my life um, are my parents and the challenges they had while we were in school. My mom and dad to this day still speak Spanish. They understand English. They can speak some English. They choose not to. But in elementary, it wasn't that they didn't want to speak English. They just couldn't. And so they would go to parent meetings because teacher said they would go to PTA meetings because the principal said and yet they were among those parents that either stood in the back of the room or stood in the back of the cafeteria and didn't understand what was going on. My brother and I, I being the oldest, we were the translators. Um, we translated for our parents what the teacher said to my mom, what my mom said to my, to my teacher until I was in fifth grade. And I'll never forget that moment. PTA meeting, my dad standing in the very back of the room with all the Spanish speaking parents, all the whites sitting in the front of the cafeteria in front of our principal, Mrs. Bowie. And the PTA meeting was going on and then my dad raised his hand. And so I knew I was gonna have to translate, but my dad raised his hand really loud and said from the back of the room, when will you take us into account? Cuando nos van a oír? When will you hear us? And in Spanish asked why he had been coming to school, meeting after meeting for four years, now five years with all these parents and no one took the time to speak to them in a language they understood. Um, I couldn't translate. I was so embarrassed. I wanted to hide. But the parents that were standing around my dad all began to clap. I looked at Mrs. Bowie and I was worried about what she was going to say because she was the principal. And instead she grabbed what was a teacher, I don't know who, that came up and translated. And Mrs. Bowie apologized to the entire auditorium and said, moving forward, these meetings, these PTA meetings and performances are going to be in English and in Spanish. And it changed, it changed my school. It changed Landrum Elementary. The next year, my dad was the PTA president. The meetings were in Spanish, translated into English. And that was only because Mrs. Bowie listened to the parents, understood what they were asking for and understood what was needed and changed it and made a difference. And so from then on, you know, I've always admired my teachers. I've always admired principals, but I realized that principals 
have the opportunity to make a difference, not only in the children and the students that they teach, but in the lives of the parents and the community that they serve. Um, so my story is one of coming through the ranks, my parents believing in education, believing in teachers, putting that emphasis in school. School always came first. Our homework came first. Even if we didn't understand, we would go down our neighbors. My parent, my dad would take me down to next door neighbor's house and say to a high school student, can you help? Because my dad couldn't read English. But I'll tell you, my dad was brilliant. When I was growing up, he gave me the Brownsville Herald the newspaper in the Valley that is translated to this day in Spanish. After school, when he got home from work, he made me read the Brownsville Herald in Spanish to him. Wow. Little did I know that learning to read in Spanish was actually helping me learn to read in English. My goodness, I was doing multiplication facts in first grade. I was doing division in first grade and all because of what my dad could teach me and all along becoming that teacher for me at home. Now we know that everything you learn in Spanish is the foundation and translates into English. And so while I always say, you know, I didn't have a bilingual education in the classroom, in the schools, I truly had the best bilingual education as a result of my dad and the importance that he paid um, to education and that that was the way um, out for us, that that was the way we were going to be um, better. Um, I graduated in a class of 314 Greyhounds. I was number 14 in the class. Um, I have to tell you, and you know, we started this meeting saying, you know, fellow Longhorn and Hook'em Horns. Um, I don't know if you all can see my chair. I have this chair because the principals that I supervised back in um, 2020, 2005, 2005 gave me this chair. And I carry it with me from office to office wherever I'm at, because the reminder, not only of the University of Texas and the great, you know, teams and all of that, but most importantly, it's a reminder of school. The University of Texas changed the trajectory of my life. Um, going to the university opened so many doors for me that I didn't know existed. I knew about universities, not because that's where I was supposed to go, but because I hung with all the boys in high school and we um, we talked football. I wanted to go to Notre Dame because they were the champions for that one year. Or I wanted to go to Texas Tech because of the Raiders. I wanted to go to UT because of the Longhorns. I didn't know what the university was about um, until a friend of mine, and she ended up being our valedictorian, she asked me, and it was in December, she asked me, Lupita, have you taken your SAT? You said you're going to the university. Have you taken your test? And I was like, there's a test to get into the university? What do you mean? You know, I can't just go. And they're like, no, you got to take a test. You have to qualify. And so she took me to the counselor's office in December and said, she needs to take the test. And the counselor looking at me and saying, no, I was in the track because I wanted a job. I had a job and that's where I had been tracked. And yet, you know, my friend said, no, she needs to take the test. And actually my friend Mona paid for the test. Um, on December 15th, I went and took the test. Um, and they, my friends helped me apply to the university. We were all going to UT. Um, I got there by the grace of God and my friends that showed me the way because my parents didn't know. Right. Um, but again, education has changed my life. 
and the university changed my life. Um, and I would say that's my story. Um, did you know that you wanted to be a teacher when you graduated from the University of Texas? Of course not. I wasn't <laughs> going to be a teacher either. Of course not. I wasn't going to be a teacher. I have to tell you, I, I wanted to be a lawyer. Once I knew, you know, that spring semester, I tell you, my friends, you know, we all, I was in the track, you know, in what they call the honors track and didn't even know what needed to happen because, you know, unfortunately, I think back then and even now, oftentimes we have unconscious biases that we see students and we say, this one can, this one cannot, this one will, this one will not. And even though I was in the honors classes, my counselor nor my teachers, you know, took the time to say, you know, Lupita, have you applied? Have you submitted scholarships? Have you done these things? Nobody asked me. Teachers, counselors didn't ask me if it wasn't because of Mona and the friends that I hung with and they happened to be going through the process, their parents were telling them what to do. If they hadn't asked me and helped me, I would have never gone to school. But once I understood, I'll, I'll never forget, you know, back then I saw it as an injustice. Um, lots of things people don't know about me, but that was one. I was very politically involved in high school and a lot of elections, but I saw it as an injustice. And as a student, as a kid, you see it, your eyes are seeing it. Sometimes you don't wanna recognize it it's the, the skin that you're in, but you see it. And so when I went to school, when I went to the university, I went as a history major and my intent was to become an attorney, to become a lawyer because of what I saw happening and people that needed help that didn't have the assistance. And so I wanted to be a public defender. That's what I went to school for. Um, I have to tell you, two years of being in the university, um, not having the money to go back, I realized that I couldn't afford to go to law school to do what I really wanted to do. So I quickly changed majors at uh, during my sophomore year. And so my degree is actually in, it's a bachelor's of science in fashion merchandising. And so with the minor in marketing. So um, when I graduated from the university, recruited straight into Houston um, to be a buyer uh, for now, you know, a store, a family store that's no longer here in Houston. But I was a buyer of men's clothing uh, for two years and then a store manager. Um, I think another point in time that my life was changed was when one of my friends came to the store that I was managing and she went to school with me at UT and she's white, Anglo, didn't speak a word of Spanish. But at the university, um, we were staying on the same floor at TC Jester. She walked by and my roommate and I had our doors open. I don't know, they still do that, but we used to have our doors open, people walking down the hallway. And I remember, and if she's out there, she's heard me say this story so many times, Babette walking down the hallway and looking in there and seeing us, Latinas, um, and she stopped and poked her head and she's like, do y'all speak Spanish? I remember my roommate and I looking at each other going like, like, is she crazy? You know, is she high? Why is she asking us this? And so we said, yes, but you know, as you grow up through school, you sometimes, unfortunately, you know, negate or try not to let people know that you speak Spanish, that your English is incorrect. And so we looked at each other and we said, yes, why? And then she proceeded to plop herself into our, our bed and said, oh, I want to be your friend. We're looking at each other going, you want to be our friend? Oh, because I want to learn Spanish. 
So Babette was, is from Houston and um, she wanted to learn Spanish because she was an education major um, and she wanted to be a bilingual teacher. So the friendship from university continues now. Um, she graduated as a bilingual teacher, went back to South Texas where I'm from and taught. And I came to Houston where she was from with no interest in being a teacher. Right. And, you know, here I am, uh, I, I would say she came back to Houston that four years later, looked me up and said, um, and that was in the mid eighties. And if you are familiar with just immigration and the ebbs and flows, um, in the mid eighties, we had a lot of people, uh, a lot of immigrants, uh, newcomers coming to you know, the states, and especially Houston, a huge uh, population uh, growth. And she came and, and saw me that day and said, you know, Lupita, I'm doing your job. I'm teaching your people. And I was like, Babette, what do you mean? And she's like, I'm back here in Houston. I am one of two bilingual teachers in the entire school. Now I'm looking at her going, oh my goodness. So she invited me to um, read in her classroom. And she goes, all I need for you to do is come read to my kids. They don't see people like you. Look at me, she'll tell you to this day, look at me, I'm a gringa and I'm doing your job. You come to my classroom. So I visited Durkee Elementary um, back in, oh my goodness. I don't even remember, 1999? No, 89, long time ago, my goodness. And I walked into Durkee Elementary to um, volunteer that day. My company actually you know, paid for us to take days off to go volunteer. So instead of going to the hospital, I went to the school. And if we have a minute, I wanna tell you the story. Here we go. So that my first time going back to elementary school since I left Landrum. So I'm going to volunteer and I'm gonna to read to her class. And I said, Babette, you know, what do you want me to read to your class? She's like, bring your book, your favorite book, whatever you wanna read. These are first graders, they're immigrants, they're from Mexico, they're from El Salvador, bring whatever you wanna read. So I looked at my little apartment, I don't have anything but a Tom Sawyer book. I don't know how it got there. So I take this Tom Sawyer book with me. I'm wearing three in inch heels. I have a, a wool um, straight skirt, goes down way below my, almost to my ankles. Now remember that was in the eighties back then and an Angora fuchsia sweater with a Liz Claiborne scarf, lots of colors. Imagine that, okay, this was at the, it was 89. I think it was 89, 1989. It had to have been 89, that's when I started teaching. So that's how I'm walking down the hallway, clup, 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 all the way to her classroom. I walk in, 22 kids sitting in desk, the bed up there, and she's like, come in, come in. So I walk in, kids get really quiet and they're all looking at me. And I have to tell you, these kids all looked like me. And I was like, she's like, we're ready, you know, all in Spanish, estamos listos. And so she says, you can, you know, come up to the front, read your book. So I'm looking in the front and there's this little wooden chair like this high right in the front. And I said, what do you want me to sit? She goes right there, <laughs> okay, tight skirt. Imagine how you're going to sit in this tight skirt. I get down, sit there, feet to the side. And then Babette does this. She claps twice. All of a sudden, these 22 little kids come all the way around me like, whew, and they're all sitting like this, just looking. And then they're, they're LLP. So for all those educators, you're in your listening, learning position. So they're all sitting cross-legged with their hands in their lap. And I was like, wow, like such control for little ones. And she said, well, just start reading your book. So of course, I speak in English. I start reading my book and the kids are like, looking at me the one one of them close to me starts rubbing on the skirt 
and I'm looking at their little hands and this is an Angora, uh, a wool white, you know, that winter white skirt. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, they're going to get all dirty. And then the other one starts rubbing my arm with an Angora sweater. What happens? You know, it starts pilling. And I was like, and so my hair was much longer. And so I have another one that starts doing my, my hair. And, and then she says, um, you're reading in English. They don't speak English. Can't you tell them in Spanish? So I'm like trying to read and tell them in Spanish. And I, I finally stopped because they're rubbing, they're touching me, they're doing my hair. And one little boy says first, maestra, maestra, usted se ve como mi mamá. So teacher, teacher, you look just like my mother. Somebody else says, you know, on this side, they're going this, you know, kind of rubbing it, but it was lo much longer. Maestra, su pelo es como el de mi mamá. Your hair is like my mother. And somebody else saying, you smell like my mother. I was like, it, you know, it took me aback to where I didn't know how to respond. And, you know, it was a moment that, you know, was, I think it touched me, but I didn't know how or what. And it certainly made an impression on the kids. Um, you know, thank goodness it was lunchtime. We went to lunch and it just touched my heart. Um, Babette called me that night and says, so now do you want to be a teacher? And I was like, it was just in my head. It was in my heart. She sent me uh, a little um, picture of Houston ISD looking for teachers. The next week I was in line at the HR department, long, long line of people wanting to fill out an application. I'm in line. I see someone walking down the line, walking up and down. They were saying, don't worry, you know, you're going to get in. All of these was um, people that were interested in becoming a teacher, the ACP or the Alternative Certification Program. Uh, Joe Neil Drayton, who I know now who it was, came and stopped and asked me, do you speak Spanish? I said, yes. Do you read Spanish? I said, yes. Do you write Spanish? And I was like, well, I've forgotten a lot, but absolutely. She took me to the front of the line and I became a teacher. And um, haven't looked back since. You've had a lot of really powerful defining moments in your life. And I'm wondering, there's a couple of things I wanna ask about. First, I have to say the story about your dad just brings me, like I was having all the chills and the tears, which doesn't happen to me normally. Um, and I wanna ask about him in a second. But first I wanna ask, when you were kind of describing your beginning journey, um, as you know where you're sitting now, how do you feel like that uh, your experience um, has impacts the work that you do now? Oh my goodness. It's, it's like ingrained in you, it's in your heart and it totally drives what I do every single day. And, you know, talking about the unconscious, but it is, it's who you are, you know, walking in to that classroom that one day, you know, so long ago and seeing the children look at you with those wide eyes and wanting more from you, that never leaves your heart, that never leaves who you are. And I continue, you know, as I visit classrooms, as I've, you know, moved on from a bilingual teacher, you know, a, a specialist to a principal to an assistant superintendent, you know, an officer, now a chief, that is in my heart. And that is what I lead with. It's, it's, it's who I am. It, you know, I was I was that child. I was that child looking for someone to understand me, to know what I was saying instead of, you know, telling me to go back and sit down. And yet I didn't understand what the teacher was saying. For someone to understand that I'd never eaten spinach or peas or macaroni and cheese, 
that's not what we ate, you know, give me some sopa, give me some rice and some beans, that's what I ate. And so, you know, those children, me walking into that classroom, it was me. I yearned to see someone that looked like my mother, that spoke like my mother, that, you know, and here I was, you know, 25 years later, and these children were experiencing the same thing. And, and really, when we walk into classrooms today, there's thousands of children experiencing the same thing. My dad sitting in meetings, I mean, he, my dad and mom worked two to three jobs, but when there was a parent meeting, when there was a PTA meeting, they made sure they were there. And they were that silent, back then silent minority, but now we are experiencing the same thing, but we have a silent majority that people aren't listening to, aren't wondering, well, why do they stand on the edges of these meetings? Why do they stand and never say a word? As school leaders, as district leaders, we need to open our eyes and see they may not say a word, but they believe in their kids, they want the best for their kids, and they believe in us as educators. They believe that we can and will make a difference. And so we need to open our eyes to them. And so those defining moments in my life is what drives me every single day. How I look at classrooms, how I work with teachers, how I coach principals to open their eyes, how I speak to counselors at high schools to say, don't wait for the kid to come to your office to say, you know, miss, I need a college application. Miss, I don't know what to do. You go out there because guess what? Those kids don't know. I was a good kid. I was an honors kid. No one took into account that, hey, maybe this little brown girl wants to go to school, but she doesn't know what to ask. Yeah, she goes around with, you know, I'm going to UT, she wants to be a Longhorn, and little does she know how she needs to get there. Right. So those moments in my life define what I do now as an educator, as, you know, hopefully, you know, coaching and guiding other leaders in education for us to open our eyes because we can do more and we need to respond to the community and the children we serve. So everything that you're describing really for me says that you're called to do equity work. And so I'm wondering, do you see that? Is that a label that you would put on for yourself? Um, and, you know, you're uniquely positioned that way, having had that experience as a child having entered into the educational field. And so really, no matter what work you're working on, you know, I mentioned and you've mentioned, you know, working on uh, magnet programs and uh, access, all of those things tie into equity. So what are your thoughts about that? You know, I think um, your experience um, molds you and defines you. You know, you talk about nature and nurture, you know, what is it? And, you know, I believe both. And so whether I've defined it now, you know, I do have that title of Chief of Innovation and Equity. And, you know, I've been really blessed with the title. But I think you're right, Dr. Rosas. I think all along, my experience, my personal experience, um, my family has guided me in that work. And maybe never being able to put a label to it until now, but it's who I am, what I believe in, and what has, you know, led my work from, you know, being a principal and being inclusive to, you know, being an assistant superintendent, you know, having the opportunity to say, you know, what is happening here is not equity, it's not equitable. Children really don't have a choice. It looks good on paper, but in reality, they don't have a choice. 
you know, they are defined by the zip code and that is absolutely wrong. And so I've been put in positions that I've had the opportunity to make a difference. Um, I'll tell you, when I became an assistant superintendent in, in, in Houston and one of my you know, dear principals, she told me, cause I'm pretty young, principals were much older than me. They're looking at me like, you're gonna lead us. <laughs> Um, and, you know, she was the first one to open her school and welcome me and host me and bring all the other principals in. And she did, um, when we sat down, she told me to whom much is given, much is expected. And I have been blessed to have lots of opportunities. And I see it as my responsibility to be able to make a difference in someone else's life. I've, I've been, you know, blessed. Um, and so I'm here only because others have gone through this, have opened those doors, and now it's my responsibility. And so, yes, I have a name and a title now, but I think it's really who I am and I lead um, with that as my purpose. That's amazing. And I really think that um, as we're able to reach a certain age and look back on our lives, um, you know, your initial inclination to be a lawyer and to fight, you know, a lawyer typically is representing someone and fighting for the rights. So you really were able, you were going to reach that pathway, uh, but it wasn't necessarily in the pathway you imagined, but really you are uh, doing the same uh, kind of work you're advocating and affecting change for people who don't have representation. Um, I was really, this will be the last thing. I know you're very busy, but I uh, was your, the story of your dad, I think was so powerful because I've spent all of my career working as a bilingual educator and then a bilingual principal and dual language programming. And, um, all, you know, although I can't say that I am the child of an immigrant, so I, I know it's not the same, but, um, I can say that having worked around families my entire career who didn't speak English or mm -hmm. were new to the United States, um, that your dad would take that moment to raise his hand and ask, when are you going to hear us? I can only imagine, you know, now as an adult, there must have been lots of things that happened to him in his life to come to that moment to take the risk. Um, and, and speak up because he was, you know, he wasn't doing that for himself. He was doing that for you and for your, your family. Um, I think that's so powerful. And I think I'm, I'm drawing a parallel. It's not a parallel, but a connection to, you know, we're still in the midst of quarantining and dealing with the effects of COVID. And so I know this year, a lot of us, we used to, th we talk about tier one instruction, like what happens in the classroom. That was, you know, the lion's share, whether you're a teacher or a principal or a district person, that's what we focused on. And we knew we wanted to involve our families, but it really always got pushed to the back. But this year, we really had to think about and count on our families and new in different ways, whether we're hybrid or a virtual or whatever we were doing. And so I wonder if you have any last thoughts about, um, you know, advocating, working with, involving our families, anything you want to share about that? Well, I do a lot of professional reading and you read a little bit here and you read a little bit here. I've got, you know, all the, at the heart of, of who I am and what I do is really, you know, children's books have so powerful messages. And so oftentimes if you get into a professional journal and I'm looking at what I have here, I can try to, you know, speak to a, a principal or p speak to one of my assistant superintendents and try to guide their work. But what I have to say is the one book that I have been sharing um, here since January, and especially because we just um, celebrated, you know, the read aloud, um, uh, read aloud the world on February 3rd. And, you know, I think that literacy at any age is what unlocks um, not only learning and education, but it gives you power. And this book, um, as people, as I have meetings with people, I don't know if you all can see it, and it's all because you matter. And as I talk to principals, as I talk to children, 
It doesn't matter who I'm talking to. What I want, for example, you know, parents and families and saying, okay, you know, they're not logging in. These kids are not logging in. These parents aren't attending the virtual meetings. We've got to stop. You know, they matter. Let's figure out what we need to do. All children matter. What can we do differently to connect? Our families matter. What can we do differently? You know, you matter, I matter. How can we treat each other differently to ensure that we are showing that compassion, that grace, that, you know what, you may not have turned in, you know, an assignment for the last three weeks. How do we show grace and compassion and say that you matter and how can we help you? So yes, the parents haven't come up. They haven't made sure that the children haven't logged in. They matter. How do we have grace and compassion while we're holding students and parents accountable? And so I would say, you know, again, there's lots of great books, but this is one that I've been sharing, um, you know, for this last month because we all matter. And there's a space and a time and grace that we need to give each other through difficult times, um, hard situations that we don't understand. Um, but it is that empathy and that action for you to do something that makes a difference. And making a difference one child at a time, I can tell you, you're changing lives, not only of that child, but of that entire family. And, you know, I'm an example of that. And um, we are those people that have the power as educators to change lives, both the children and the entire families, ultimately the community that we serve. And that's what drives me. Well, thank you, Dr. Hinojosa. I really do uh, think that you've had such a fascinating journey and, um, you have impacted so many lives and I just want to appreciate you for your time and for your story because it's really just sharing this story is going to change the trajectory of other people who may be teachers or principals are on this journey to really support our community's families uh, and um, everyone in our lives. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me and um, this opportunity and you know, at the end of the day, just whoever's out there know that you can. If a little girl from South Texas that didn't speak a word of English can be here and do this, you know, you can, everyone can. Just don't give up and, and give yourself that grace and that space. Uh, yes, we fail, but it's that getting up and that determination. Um, as my dad said, you know, adelante con ganas, si se puede, you can do this, mijita. So let's keep moving forward. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening to this interview. I hope you found value in the conversation, made a connection with your own life, and had an aha moment or two. 